pull up 2.1. That don't look right. Y'all are going to feel good about yourselves. All right. Now, first of all, when you're talking about any kind of function, you need to be able to write it in terms of either set notation or set builder notation. Now, I do not use set builder notation, I use interval notation. So, and most of your instructors, most of your math instructors is going to use uh, interval notation. Now the difference between the two, if I give you a set and I tell you that I want you to write that set in a form that you can understand, most people are going to pick interval notation. Uh, I like interval notation because you actually read from left to right. Okay. One, you read from left to right. Two, is simple. And three, you don't have to write a big long sentence. It's short. Short and what? If I tell you that I want to write all the numbers in the set from negative 1 to infinity, then most of you know from the number line days, there's negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I want to know all the numbers that are greater than or equal to negative one, and you shade in that number line like this, and you shade in that arrowhead, which is called positive infinity. And you remember doing that back in whatever algebra. And then you were told to write a set notation of this answer. And that set notation could either be set builder notation, which is the algebraic way or the mathematical way of writing it, and then the practical application, which is usually the interval notation, read from left to right, would be negative 1 to infinity, and that would be your interval notation. Now I'm just going to cover interval notation. Uh, you need to know about set builder notation for, for the homework or the test. Set builder notation would be just like writing your answer. X is greater than or equal to negative 1, and then putting an X such that in front of it. X such that, and then put braces around it. Now that's your set builder notation. Much more academic than the interval notation. Just put them over there. Alright? And y'all get them every day. Just leave me at least one piece on it. Alright, y'all go ahead. If y'all want to go down and get something to drink, that's fine if you want to, but I'm going to keep on going. Um, go over to the bathroom, get you a napkin, that's your plate. Alright. I'm not going to go into uh, y'all want pizza or pizza. Alright. Um, just some things you might want to remember about set builder notation. And this is what you should remember when you first started set builder notation and, and writing sets and functions is that when you have these two guys I'm not going in the same direction. you're dealing with an open circle or what? parentheses and when you're dealing with these two guys you're dealing with what kind of circle? Or a closed circle, yes. Or you're dealing with what? Closed square parentheses. No, be quiet. All right. And one other note: negative infinity and positive infinity always, always get what? Parentheses. Now that's the stuff you should have learned back in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. I'm not going to spend time going over this because that's one of the first things 
that you should memorize when dealing with functions and inequality. And most of the time, if you read from left to right, you won't get confused with it. I mean, I mean, we spend all of our life reading from left to right, unless you're from the Middle East, Masalama. And if you're from the Middle East, then you read from right to left. But if you read, if you were born and raised in the United States, which most of you were, or at least that you lived in the United States most of your life, you read from left to right. It always amazes me when students get to math and algebra, they start reading the graph from right to left. They start reading the equations from right to left. They start reading the set field notations from right to left. When did we say in math that you have to start reading from right to left? y'all start doing it. Not y'all in here, but the students. They just start reading from right to left. I give them a, I give them a, a number line, and I shade it, and I got a zero, negative one, negative two, one, two, three, and I say, um, that right there, and then I shade it. And of course, this is positive infinity. This is positive infinity, and this is what? Negative infinity. And I put this on a test. This is what students will write. One to negative infinity. And it just blows my mind. You have been taught to read left to right all your life. You get to math, and you read what? Why? Who, who told you to read from right to left? Some DA teacher, evidently, because it's not just one person, it's four or five of y'all out of the class of 30. Or, this is not something about this class, I'm just saying. If I put 30 students in this classroom and I put that on a test, four, four or five of y'all will put one to negative infinity, and I have no earthly idea of one. And it just bothers me. Okay, I won't do this, but I can do it. Yeah, I could see that, but still, this is a mathematical sentence. It's a, it's a solution. I can understand that, but you know, ninety percent of the time, you read from left to right. So it, now that's correct, but it just boggles my mind. I would read it from negative infinity to one. And a lot of people say, well, here, what difference does it make? Well, you need to be what? Whatever you decide, you need to be what? Consistent. You need to be consistent, therefore you don't get confused. I tell students, read inequalities left to right and bottom up. Why bottom up? Well, most of you have walked down the sidewalk before, right? Most of y'all walk down the sidewalk. Walking down a sidewalk that's two or three hundred foot long. Most of you, in general, will look downward at where you're walking. Now, there are a few people that you know of that walk with their nose in the air. Okay? But that's not you. There are people that most of the time they, they look down. And then when something happens, what do you do? You look up. Not many people do, do this walking down a sidewalk and look down. Not many people do that. So your general is left a bit bottom up or left to what? And thus you have the first part. Okay? So most people do that, but I can see your point. That's the first person that I've got to ask that to you. The first person has actually said you are here, and that makes sense. I never thought about that. Alright, so Interval notation is what we're going to use a lot of, but what do we use a, what do we use it for? Well, you're going to be dealing with functions. And <clears throat> functions is a 25 cent word for equation, basically. Um, I give you two or three examples of functions. You tell me what the input is, an output, and you tell me what the function is. Here's an example. Uh, one of your examples that I use all the time, of course, 
some of y'all may not know what this is. Some of you may, and I'm not a, I'm not an artist, so don't, don't need to make fun of my drawing. I know I'm not an artist. That's why I teach, okay? So some of y'all that are like Rembrandt and Michelangelo, Angelo, whatever his name is, you have a good jump in the lake, all right? That's still not, okay, let me put this in here. No, that's wrong. Now, most of you probably don't know what this is. The garbage bin. No. Ice box. Ice. It's an ice machine. You used to see them a lot on every floor of what? The hotel. Now you just have the little dispenser and just take a little bucket. You have to take, it takes about 15 of those buckets to fill up the tub. Okay, just some, some of y'all might know that. And we'll plug it through. There's about 15 of them. We at least get it halfway. But anyway, ice machine. No. Some of y'all know what I'm what I'm filling up the bathtub for. Some of y'all don't. That's all right. Oh. I don't need to specify because I specify. Then somebody will say, "Here, we're talking about this," and then my partner will call and say that I want to be talking about that. So. We have some uptight people in the world. All right. What is the input for this function? Well, it's water, and the output is. I know ice. Now, let me ask you a question. What if I was to give you, in other words, I cut the water off. Cut it off. Just take a saw and I cut the PVC or whatever it's called, just cut it. And I put a funnel on the end of it. And in that funnel, I tell you to pour. Let's just draw the funnel. And in that funnel, I tell you, we're not going to pour water. I want you five gallons of cherry oil. Then what will we get out? We won't get ice. We will get what? We will get five gallons worth of cherry what? Cherry, did I say cherry? I'm sorry, cherry. I like cherry. Cool. And, and cherry and grape. That's the kind of like. Cherry ice cubes. What if I say, okay, after that five gallons, I want to put, just forget about the five gallons of cherry Kool-Aid, I want you to put in three gallons of lime <laughs> Kool-Aid. And you put in three gallons of lime Kool-Aid. What will you get out of it? Gallons of lime. Three gallons worth of green ice. What in the world does this have to do with functions? Well, your function is the ice machine, right? It's actually doing the job of turning the liquid into a salt, right? Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. But what a lot of people don't understand is what does this depend on? This depends on what? The cubes depend on what? The amount of Kool-Aid you put into the ice machine. So if I put in five gallons of Kool-Aid, I'm going to get five gallons worth of ice. If I put in three gallons, I'm not going to get five gallons worth. I'm going to get three gallons worth. So what depends on what? That's just not the choice. Ice depends on the water. So let's write that thing. Ice depends and I want you to underline the word depends on the Kool-Aid or whatever, the water. All right, now let's go back. Let me write that down somewhere to the side. Let's go back to what our ice is. What's a good word for the ice in this? Since we've got a function, 
What is the ice? It's going what? It's going into the function, right? So what could we call the ice? We could call it the, the input. The input. And what do you think the cool? I mean, the uh, ice cube is going to be called the output. Out, I was looking for output and input. The output. Well, that's still not mathematical enough, so we're going to take it down another notch. What's another word for input in result in in, re, in reference to x and y? You're stealing my thunder. You're going to fail this class. All right, x is our input, right? Because any function we do, any function we have, there's going to be what input? It'll be an x. And we put numbers in for x, and what do we get? We get y. Now, the numbers that we put in for x can be called the domain. The domain. I thought that's what you were looking for. No, that's all right. You're, you're already, it's, it's over. Sorry. <laughs> no matter what you make on the test, you're as well as drop. And the domain gives result to the range. The range. The range. The range. So now we can say, because we are in algebra class, Y depends on output depends on and range depends on you would not believe how many people are in college and have not made have not made this whatever concept have not understood did not understand it whatever the case may be. So therefore, what is this called? This is called the dependent. And this would be called independent. So have you ever heard of the dependent variable and the independent variable? Now you know. X is always the independent variable. Now what if what if you have D is equal to R times T? Well, you're not going to be give, you're not going to be given two unknowns because you only have one equation, right? So you're going to have one unknown. So you're going to be given something. So you're going to be given T. Well, if you're given t, then d, t is your dependent to independent variable, and d is your what? Independent, because it's in the place of y. All right? So I'm just telling you that's how that works. So if you're given a function, the function is going to be this guy. 2x plus 3. That's an example of a function. Uh, x squared minus 6. That is a function. Uh, 4x. That is a function. Then your x values or whatever you can use in that. Your y values is whatever is dependent upon that. Now you can plug in several things here. That's nice machine. Last semester, no. January last year, my father passed away, and it was on January 13th, January 13th, and the class started on 14th or 15th or something like that. And so I wasn't able to teach the first week of class. And uh, my boss, Park did, came in and taught the classes the ones that she could. And one of them was a college algebra class. So she taught it for the first week, and or the first week and a half, I can't remember how much it was, because I think the first, yeah, we had the Martin Luther King Day, so I didn't teach until that next week. And uh, I came into class and I started teaching on functions. Because she said she had went to the review, so, and, and she said, I, I covered a little bit of, of uh, chapter one, or whatever chapter this is. 
And uh, I came in and I said, okay, we're going to go over, but I'm going to make sure everybody's on the same sheet of music. And uh, I drew this on there and I said, somebody tell me what this is. I wasn't expecting anybody to know. And of course, everybody went, everybody. It was like in unison. Everybody went, ice machine. And I went, what's going on here? There's not that many people, but that, that's a terrible drawing, okay? It was much worse than this, okay? And uh, I said, okay, all right. I guess I got a bunch of smart kids here. So I went on and I drew another picture and, and I knew they weren't going to get this right because I couldn't draw and it was a bunch of blocks. And everybody went, that's a hay baby. I said, well, wait a minute. I, and that's when I stopped. I said, okay, what? Y'all are not supposed to know that that's a hay baby. And uh, everybody was stickering and laughing. And I said, how did y'all know that was a hay baby? We've already done this. And I said, how have you already done it? Because I have not taught it. She taught it. And what she had done is she had had one of my students. And she loved these. So she memorized them. She took those, that student that she had in Trig, that was my college algebra student, and she stole my little ice machine in my... In my hey, baby. Hey, baby. She stole it. But I thought that's a compliment. What is it? Flattery is... What is it? Uh, imitation is the greatest one of Yeah, exactly. So I was like, what's the next one? She said, uh, they said, bicycle. I said, that's all the song again. She used all my, all my little <laughs> things. But anyway, I thought that was interesting that she did that. But a bicycle, I always use bicycle because, one, I can't draw it, but, you know, there's the handlebars, dang old seat. All right, shut up. I don't want to hear it. If you want to draw it, you come up here and draw it, okay? Chain, dang old. All right, now, there's your bicycle. Input, output. Now, a lot of people say, well, you got to get on it. No, you ain't got to get on it. You have to what? What do you have to do for an order for a bicycle stay up. Move it now. You have to what? You have to move it. Yeah, I don't care if you're a good balancer. You can't sit there and unless you just sit two or three hours a day and try to balance, you know, without movement. You might be one of those people, but anyway, in order to for a normal person to balance a bicycle, it has to be what? Move. And in order for it to move, you have to have some kind of leg power. Right? Or arms, depending on if you've lost your legs in the war or whatever. Because if you have a veteran, and I'm a veteran, so I can say this, and they come home and they don't have the legs, and they're sitting on a bicycle, what's going to happen? They're going to fall over. And a lot of you are insisting. No, it's called a fact. If you put a person that does not have legs, on a bicycle, they're going to fall down because you have to have leg power. That input is essential. Essential. Just like the water. You can plug up an ice machine for 20 days, and if you don't have any water going into it, you're going to burn it up. Why? Because that motor is going to sit there and run and run and run until it does what? It burns out because you don't have any water going into it. But you can say that, but you can't say there's no legs. Anyway, if you don't have legs, you're going to fall down. All right? Period. If you put leg power in it, you get motion out of it. Same thing with the hay bale. Now, let me ask you a question. What if you just are lazy and you just go half at it? Well, if you put half legs into it, what you gonna get? Half motion. If you pedal as hard as you can for two hours, then you're gonna what? You're gonna get somewhere. If you sit on a bicycle and put your legs, and let's say you had legs, and you sit there and you put your pedal, your foot on one pedal and your foot on the other, and you don't move, what's going to happen? You're going to fall down. No leg power. 
Well, this is my hay bale, so just go ahead and make fun of it. No, but the whole point is I'm drawing it. They won't tire. Okay. What about the sexy tractor? I don't, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard a stupid song like that. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying that. Stupid. Anyway, there's your head buddy. Now, some of y'all have no idea. Well, that's your parents' fault, okay? The hay baler picks up the grass that is cured, which is called hay. What's the difference between hay and straw? No, straw don't have a head on it. Straw is just for bed. Like, you know, one, let's see, let's, let's, I don't know. Some of y'all might have a cat. I don't know. Some of you might not have kids, whatever. You want it to lay. Or a dog. Some of you may have a dog, and you put hay, or you put straw in its doghouse, so it has something to lay on it. That's what straw is for. Hay has a head on it. If you don't cut the head off, it's used for a food. Yeah, the three pigs did. Yeah, one of the three pigs. Yeah, but you can use straw in your houses with mud. And you make bread. Yeah. We're not talking about that in here, okay? <laughs> All right, so the, the, the grass... Okay, the grass that you mow down, you let it sit for two or three days. If you have windrows, windrows are like rows of grass, just like this, in other words, it's wide. And those windrows are very tall. And that means you got a lot of what? Got a lot of hay. So that means you're going to have a lot of what coming out of this hay bale. You're going to have a lot of hay bales. If you have a little bit, windrows and some places there's not even any grass then what are you going to get out? Very few hay bales. It's old saying you get out of it what you what? And that's your domain and range. Now let me give you an example. Bicycle, dang old legs, fall down, grass, you don't have any, you don't get any hay bales. Ice, you got to have water to make ice. Let's take f of x is equal to x squared plus 4. Now x is your input, x squared plus 4 is your hay bale or your ice machine, and your output is based on what? Your input. Let's say that in your universe you're only allowed to go from negative 4 to positive 4. And I tell you that on the test or the homework, or the directions tell you that on the test or the homework. Can you use 5? No, you cannot. Can you use 7? No. You can only use negative 4 or positive 4. So your world, there is no 7. There is no 14. There is, there's only negative 4 or positive 4. So you go back to your pre-algebra days because you're struggling, you don't know what's going on and you want to make sure you get this right. So you go back to your pre-algebra days and you plug in negative 4, negative 2, negative, I'm sorry, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. No, I'm sorry, that's reading left to right. This is what y'all do. Four, two, negative one, zero, one, negative two, six, or no, can you have six? Three and four. That's what y'all do. Another thing I haven't never figured out is why y'all do that. But you read it left to right all your life. Don't understand this. There's no what? There's no pat no, there's no <laughs> pattern. There's no there's no anything. It's just... Well, actually, there is a pattern. It's positive, positive. Yeah, pattern. it's screwed up is what it is. Remember, you, you don't exist. Okay. There's no 
method. No. This sucks, okay? Don't do it. Don't do it. All right, so I put my... What, what is this called? Table of value. No. It's called, it starts with a D. Domain. domain. This is your domain. Oh, I thought you were talking about the Your domain is all the numbers from negative 4 to positive 4. It includes fractions, decimals, and whole numbers. But none of y'all use fractions and decimals, so we're just going to use whole numbers. And negative 4 squared is what? 16. 16 plus 4 is 40. <laughs> It's just not my day. 20. And that's going to be here, 20 also. Negative 3 squared is 9. 9 plus 4 is 2 squared is 4 plus 4 is 8. 1 plus 4 is 5. And 0 plus is 1. Now, that's pre-algebra, looking pre-algebra wise, make sure I didn't make a mistake. One squared is one plus four is five. Two squared is four plus four is eight. Three squared is nine plus four is 13. Four squared is 16 plus four is 20. Make sure I didn't make a mistake. What, why did you put zero? Yeah, what's zero one? Why is it one? It should be a four one, I'm sorry. I thought that was a one, my bad. I just make sure you're on the way. Okay, so we're happy. Now, the reason I'm showing you this, I know all y'all know how to graph it. I know you know how to do it, but I'm trying to show you something. So bear with me. Negative four and twenty. One, two, three, four, and twenty. Negative four, one, two, three, four, and twenty. Negative three and thirteen. Negative three, thirteen. Negative positive 3, 13, 2 and 8, 2 and 8, 2 and 8, and 1 and 5, 1 and 5, 1 and 5, and 0. And there is your parabola. Use your imagination. Or draw for him and on the side. Okay, now. I didn't mess it up. Domain is x values only. I want you to highlight, underline, whatever, x values. So in this case, the domain is represented by this green line, which goes from negative 4 to what? Now, let me ask you a question. Will you be given the domain most of the time? No. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, you will. Why? Because we should naturally assume that what goes into an ice machine? Okay, then why do you not, why do people not take ice machines and do it to guess? Because there's no sense in it. Now, a lot of you say, what does that have to do with it? You cannot have a function if the domain is not what? Specified. Now, most of the time, if the domain is not specified, if I tell you, just graph the function, I am assuming that you're going to use any number you want to for the domain. I am not putting a restriction as an instructor. I am not putting a restriction on the domain. But if I give you a restriction on the domain, then I'm basically 
withholding or I'm holding you back as far as the numbers that you can use. Now, if I withhold on the domain, that means you're restricted on the what? If I restrict you on the domain, that means you're restricted on the what? Range, because the range is dependent upon the domain. So your range on this problem will be from four to what? Nope. If the domain has a beginning and an end, then the range will have a what? And it won't be infinity unless the domain is infinity. This one has a beginning and an end with a number. So your range will have a beginning and an end. What is your range? Well, this is forward. It starts at four. I'll tell you. Look, lay on up. So, four to what? To 20. And that's your range. Your range can only be in terms of what? Of what? Why, Hubert? You showed us that a while ago. You went through it three times a while ago, Hubert. can only be in terms of why. Now, when I talk about increasing and decreasing values and all this good stuff in a few minutes, I just told you that the only thing that's in terms of why is the range. I'm going to ask y'all what the increase and decrease of values are, and y'all going to say uh, y is equal to negative 2. Now listen to what I'm saying. This, this is the only thing that's in terms of y. It's the range. That's it. Everything else is in terms of x. Increasing and decreasing values. Domain. Everything is in terms of x except for the range. The range is the only thing in terms of y. And I think I've said that at least four times today. So when is the range, when is the domain affected? Since the range, you ain't got to worry about the range because the range depends on the domain. But when is the domain affected? The domain effect is affected in three examples. Domain is and I don't know whether it's say you English people can affect it. I don't know which one. I think it's E. Effective. Effective. I think it's A. I think it's A. If it's a verb, it's, it's an A. I don't know. Domain is affected, <coughs> one, by the instructions or instructor that can't fail. Meaning that the instruction tells you graph the following function from negative 10 to positive 10. The range has been affected because what is affected? The domain is affected. When, when else is the domain affected? With a rational function. What do you mean rational function? Well, what's the word for rational or ration or ratio? Or over ratio. Huh? Fraction. Example. F of X is equal to 1 over x plus 2. Why is the domain affected here? That's not rhetorical. Because you can't have 0 where? So therefore, there is a number here that will blow the function up. And if there's a number that will blow the function up, then there's a number you can't what? You can't use. And if you can't use a number for input, the domain is affected. If the domain is affected, that means the range is affected. If you pour purple food coloring in your ice machine, or in your water that's going in your ice machine, what are you going to get? 
purple eyes. If you have a number that doesn't work in your function, what's the number? Negative 2. Negative 2 will give you what? Zero. So you cannot use negative 2. You can use all numbers except for negative 2. Well, then what does that do to the range? It's going to throw monkey wrench in the range and there's going to be a spot somewhere on the graph that has an open circle or has a vertical asymptote. What about a radical function? And radical function I'm going to put with even index. Why do I have to put that? And that's f of x is equal to the square root of x minus 2. That's an example of a radical function. Why is the domain affected on radical functions? And an even index. What can you not have in a radical with an even index? You can have a 2 or a 0. A negative. You can have 0. Oh. But you can't have a negative. So here, like negative three. Square root of negative three, you did that on your calculator, with the calculator drill team, people can take it to the bathroom level, right? You'll get an E-R-R-O-R, pronounce it however you like. And that's when you quit the problem because you can't think because you draw a calculator too much and you know, it gives you that error and you don't know what to do. You ever met somebody like that? Y'all thought it was an error. Just quit. Go to the next problem. You can't think for yourself. You can't take the square root of what? Negative number. With even index. So again, the range is affected because the what? The domain is affected. No, that's that's i is just another way, it's just a fancy way of writing the square root of a negative number. But yeah, you can do that, but we're not doing that right now. In other words, if you come up, if you've got, if I give you this right here, and I say, what is the domain of that function? First thing you're going to do is set the graphicant equal to zero, and find out that two will give you what? Zero. Zero is okay. You can take square root of zero. Square root of zero is zero. What about three? Or what about negative? Let's see. I said two. Sorry. What about one? Can't do one. How about zero? Can't do it. How about negative one? Can't do it. So what is our domain? All numbers greater than or equal to what? Two. Two minus two is what? Zero. Square root of zero is zero. Three. Three minus two is what? One. Square root of one is one. one. Four minus two is two. Square root of two is one point four. Three minus two, or I'm sorry, three, four, five. Five minus two is three. Square root of three is one point five seven. What's next? Uh, six. Six minus two is four. Square root of four is two. So the domain is not affected, and the range is not what? Affected. So if I plug in a negative 1, what happens? I get the square root of negative 3, and your calculator gives you a what? Error, depending on where you're from. If you're from around here, if there's only one syllable, syllable in the word. Error. <laughs> but if you're a teacher, you can't say that, so I just spell it out. E-R-R-O-R. Because there's always going to be one person in the classroom perfect. And that person pronounces O I L perfectly. Even though the sign out there is a name that huge stuff that they're Okay? So, now you can all figure out how you say O I L. To yourself, please. Alright, so if I give you a function. First, you're going to see if I change the domain or range. If I don't say, then it's, ain't, then it's, it's all up to you. So let's take this function. 
f of x is equal to x squared plus 4x plus 4. Automatically, you know that the answer for the domain is all real numbers. Why? Is there a rule that says parabola is all real numbers? No. Well, why, why is the domain not affected? Because the only way that I can affect that domain is by the instructions or the instructor. In other words, I tell you the domain is negative 4 to positive 4, or the directions say only use negative 4 to positive 4. Why is it all real numbers unless that number 1 happens? Why, why is it all real numbers? Because it's not a radical and it's not a what? Not radical, radical or rational function. Well, Hubert, are you telling me that if it's not a radical or rational function, then domain is always going to be all real numbers? Yes or no? No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're going to say. Okay. All real numbers, unless what? The instructor or the instructor changes. So I can give you these all day long. What's the answer going to be for domain? All real numbers. What about this? What's the domain? All real numbers. Why? Because it's not a rational, rational or radical function. Can I plug 0.5 into that problem? Yes. Can I plug one half into that problem? Yes. You can plug anything you want to in it because one half squared is one eighth. Uh, one half squared is one fourth. And one half to the third power is one eighth. You're not going to get something crazy like one over zero or the square root of negative one. Anytime you see a function, I can give you f of x is equal to x plus two. All real numbers. Unless I put something in the direction or on the test or I say it. You can only use negative five to positive five then I have affected, or the instructions of the instructor has affected the right, or the domain which affects the right. Now, you gotta be careful here because, let's take this first one here. Because you would do this on the calculator. You wouldn't graph this. You would just do it on the calculator because those calculator drill team people, you know, they know, call you, they know, calculator and name. My calculator is named Charlotte. Y'all laugh. Yeah. You ever seen people can't make change and run the cash register? Those are the people I'm talking about. Don't raise your hand. Don't say nothing. You know, I didn't say nothing. I don't know any of y'all. What are you talking about me? Shut up. You ever met somebody? Bill is $11.57. You give him a $20 bill and seven cents, watch your head explode. <laughs> your calculator is pending. I do it all the time just to see if the person in front of the cash register. Let me ask you something. If you own a business and you have a person running a cash register and couldn't make change, what does that make you? Not smart. Because if that person can't make change, what's, what's going to happen to that register every night? It's going to be short. And about the third or fourth time, what are you going to do to that person? Fire. Anyway. This thing looks like this. So the domain is all real numbers, and the range is from four to what? Now Hubert, how did you know that? Well, that's what we're gonna be doing in the next two weeks, is I'm gonna show you how to do that without using the calculator, but just using that thing between your <coughs> ears to talk to you. Me. No sneezing. All right. <laughs> thing between your brain. So let's just go ahead and get started on that. Now, this is where I go a little bit against the syllabus. We're going to start completing square today. Okay? And that will cover all the way through at least chapter, what, chapter 2? I think all the way to chapter 3. But, I'm going to teach you how to do complete and square, and then we're going to spend the next two weeks on doing complete and square until you are sick of doing complete and square. Two reasons. One, 
is when you get the first variable calculus, you'll be able to throw up one of these in a few seconds and be able to know what it's doing in a few seconds versus the person trying to put you down on calculus. Two, you're going to have to use complete the square in first variable calculus to do the denominator of some of your things that's under a radical, like something x squared plus blah, 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 under a square root in the denominator. And the best thing to do is make a binomial square out of it. And the only way to do that is complete the square. So completing the square is very important. Another thing complete the square does, it not only gives you the x-intercepts, but it also gives you the vertex. In order to get that with quadratic formula, you have to use two more two more formulas. Okay, quadratic formula. When do you use the quadratic formula? When you have this. This is when you use the quadratic formula that they drilled you on in high school so much. Two point two five x squared plus three point seven five x plus two point three. That's when you use the quadratic formula. When you have decimal notation in your quadratic. When is that? Hardly ever. But why do they teach it to you? Because you can use what? What do you use with the quadratic formula? You're supposed to say it. Your calculator. And if you use your calculator, you won't make any stupid mistakes and you'll make a what? Better grade. But you won't be able to make change in your world. So we're going to do it this way. We're going to do it completely square. So let's take x plus n, yes, you can factor this. And let's go over that right quick. To get your x-intercepts, there's several ways to find the x-intercepts of a function. One is to use the reverse FOIL. and set equal to what? Zero. Because your y is always zero for your x-intercepts. You know that. But you're always going to set it equal to zero. Two, your shortcuts. Remember factoring using the shortcuts? Three, the quadratic formula, which we just said is pretty much worthless because it makes you depend on the calculator. And then there is completing the square. Now, now a lot of you, if you've had algebra before, you remember doing these two. And then you had the high school teacher that made you sing a little song. X is equal to square root. Da, 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 da. Oh, this is stupid. Okay? That's stupid. This one should be taught last as far as importance. Okay. These are only doable if your trinomial is what? Factorial. Which one is not restricted at all? Completely square. So I could either teach you three or four ways and you can only use three of them, or I could teach you one way and you use it all the time. And that's the way I do it. I teach you to complete the square and you use it all the time. Now I realize, I'm a math teacher, got a couple of degrees, I realize that that is, is x plus 2 quantity squared. I don't need <coughs> a freshman student telling me that. Okay? So I know that. I'm doing it to show you the relationship. So, f of x is equal to x squared plus 4x plus 4. First thing I'm going to do is set it equal to 0 x squared plus 4x plus 4 is equal to 0. Now this is where you need to write down in your notes what I just did. Set equal to 0. Why? Because when you find your x-intercept, what is y? Always. 0. So I'm setting my y equal to 0. Where's y? f of x. Now what I do? Well, do y'all remember ax squared plus bx plus what? C. That's right, class. This is C. 
So this is number one. Number two, move C. I always love this step. I must say move C. And I always have a student raise their hand. And what do they ask? Well, no, besides that. What do they ask after I tell them what C is? Where? Okay, well, let's go over the concept of equals. How many sides of equal sign are there? Hmm? Two. C right now is on the left-hand side. Right? If I tell you to move C, what's the only possibility for you to move it? To the right-hand side. You see what I'm talking about? Where, I'm going to move it up. There's only two sides of an equal sign. Left and right. If I tell you to move C, and C is on the left-hand side, there's only one place to move it. Like I told my eight-year-old last night. Think before you ask, because most of the time, you can actually what? Answer your own questions. Move it. So here we go. And three are, yeah, three. Add blanks. So here we go. X squared plus 4X plus blank is equal to negative 4 plus blank. several ways to teach complete and square. This is about the third way of teaching. I have taught for a while, 20 years, close to 20 years, and this is the way that people like it. Now you may not like it right now, because nobody likes it right now because you don't like complete and square because you've never been taught complete and square or some of you have to it. But some of you are like, oh, uh, what? Just bear with me to be alright. This is the easiest way for me to teach you. I could teach it to you all on the left-hand side, on this side, right here. But I have found that when I teach this, students like this better because it's more structured. Versus on the left-hand side, it looks more unbelievable on the left-hand side. So just bear with me. Now here is the most important part of completing the square. This is 90% of completing the square right here, number four. It's in red, pop. Oh, that means I need to highlight it in my notes. Take B, divide by 2, and what? Square. B, divide by 2, and square. So I'm going to do it in red. And what do you think is going to go in the blanks? That number. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say B. Divided by 2 and square. B divided by 2 and square. So you need to do this in your notes and highlight it. Or just wait and watch the video five or six times. Now, in this case, what is B? 4. 4. Divided by 2 is 2 squared, which is. So that 4 is going to go here and here. So I'm going to rewrite my equation. x squared. Uh, x squared plus 4x plus blank is equal to negative 4 plus blank. So I'm going to take my red and put a 4 here and a 4 here. Now, as I told you before, this one was factorable. So that's why you're getting these repetitive numbers. It's not always going to be like that. Now, after you do number four, you will have shortcut number one or number two on the left-hand side. So now you have on the left hand side shortcut number one or number two based on the sign of the 4x. So 
So what does that give you here? What is that? X plus what? X plus 2 quantity squared is equal to 0. Now this is where I have to throw in. Remember me putting the shortcuts up for y'all the other day? And I told you, if you don't know these, you need to learn them or see me after class or see me during office hours because you're going to see them until you get out of mathematics. Which for some of y'all, it's going to be a while because you're engineering majors or science majors. And that's going to be statics and dynamics. And when you get out of statics and dynamics, you may be through with math classes, which would be count three. Mm -hmm. y'all tell me when y'all I have been in school for 5,000 years. I don't know how to do this. Shut up. All right, ain't been in 5,000 years. All right, so take this. We're going to take this over to the next page. So you just keep writing in your notes. I can trust you. Uh, no idea. Okay, you suck. All right. It's 58. It's what? 358. What time's the class over? Huh? It's 348. <laughs> See? That's why you're going to fail. <laughs> Mr. Lee, put it down. I said 348. No, you didn't. You said, I don't know. You said, I had no idea. No. All right, it's 10 to what? Four? Yeah, what time's the class over? 59. How much? 55. Okay, five minutes. 49. I don't know. I can't tell. <laughs> All right. At this point right here, you got two things. You got your vertex written in two forms. All right. One is just get the vertex written, take the opposite of both numbers. What number? Well, there's only two numbers in that problem. Where are they? Two and what? Zero. Well, what about two up in the corner? That's an exponent. That's not a number. That's an exponent. I didn't say exponent. I said numbers. All right. So take the opposite of both. This is one form of finding the vertex. And that's negative two and zero. So there's your vertex. And you can say negative zero, but it doesn't make it sound negative zero. But if that was a four, then it'd be negative two, negative four. If this was a negative two, it would be negative 2, positive 2. It's always the opposite of both for that. If you do it in this form. If you do it in this form, f of x is equal to x plus 2 quantity squared minus 0. In other words, you bring this over and set it equal. This is called intercept form. Sometimes the homework or the test will ask you to put the vertex in this form. Here, you take the opposite of this guy, take the opposite of that guy, and just bring this down. Okay, bring down. And this is the opposite. Now, a lot of you say, well, I like the top one. Well, most of the time, this is what you're going to use when you're drawing you're, most, you're not going to sit here and say, okay, I'm going to draw a parabola, but first got to put it in intercept form. No, you don't have to do this. This is what you'll use when you draw. So most of the time, that's what you're going to use. This is what you write for a test or homework. You need to bring down the, uh, the negative when it says zero. This, you do the opposite. 
If this was a negative four, you would just bring it down negative four. Oh, okay. You just bring down. You don't. You don't okay. take the opposite. That's that's why I did that. I'll change it. I mean, we'll do another one when y'all come back. And all right, now that's that's what it'll give you. It'll give you the vertex, and then it'll give you your x-intercept. X plus two quantity squared is equal to zero. And now you just what? Solve. So how do you solve? You got the x square root of both sides. And that's x plus two is equal to positive negative zero. Now this is important. I need you to take a highlighter and highlight that and this. Now with zero it doesn't matter. But what's the square root of 4? Positive or negative 2? What's the square root of 9? Positive or negative 3? And that's going to make a difference because you've got two x-intercepts. Positive 3 and negative 3. There's two x-intercepts. So x, bring that 2 over. x is equal to positive or negative 0 minus what? 2. And that's where you get the two x-intercepts. In this case, 0 is 0 no matter what. But if this was a 1, you'd have positive 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. So you've got a negative 1 and a negative 3 is the x-intercept. In this case, it's what? x is equal to 0 minus 2 is negative 2. So this is your x-intercept. So your graph, your graph, looks like this because your vertex and your x-intercept is the same thing. Does that happen all the time? No, it does not. The y-intercept, let's go back to the original problem. The y-intercept is what? Four, Hubert. That's right, five. C. So C, there's positive four. Somebody tell me what the domain of this function is. All real numbers. That's no way right. What's your range? Zero, positive infinity. Yes, ma'am. Uh, four, right here. That's your y-intercept. C is always your y-intercept on a parabola, on a quadratic. Now, just to show a hand, just for me, how many people have never seen complete the square? Don't be shy. Okay, so there's four, so that means there's probably eight in here that haven't seen it. Okay? Get used to it, because this is what you're going to be doing for the next two weeks. What I would suggest you do is make up some and make them up all day long, because what can you check it on? Your calculator. Graph it on your calculator, and then find the vertex, and then match it up with what you get for a vertex. Then check the x-intercept. That's what we're going to be doing for the next two weeks. I need to take the roll. Don't forget the pizza if you haven't got a piece. All right. Let me get the roll pulled up here and turn. Somebody hit that button for me. On the camera? Yep. Thank you. The, the, the silver button, yeah. Just hit it one time. And I will pull up the... Right now, as far as homework, I have no idea what 2.1 and 2.3. I'm not really concerned with you doing homework on the uh, thing right now. What I would like for you to do is go home, make up some quadratics, x squared plus 3x minus 2. No, don't make up it. Okay, forget that. Do not do any homework that, on that. Just wait till Wednesday. Okay, so you don't have any homework for this class, all right? Don't do anything. Please don't. I don't want to I don't want you screwed up. Because some of y'all will go home and make x squared plus three x plus four and you'll try to divide the three by two and you'll do a decimal and that's the whole point of me showing you complete square so you won't do a decimal because if you do a decimal you're gonna rely on what? Your calculator. So that's don't do it. 
just don't do anything. Y'all got the y'all got from now until Wednesday off, okay? Oh, but I was really wanting to do homework here, but shut up. All right. Everybody here. Okay, Anderson's here. Baron? Here. I don't know why that's doing that. Go away. Okay, Baron, you here? Yeah. Where are you? Right here. Oh, okay. I didn't I didn't, I'm trying to get some trying to get some names where you where you where you face with your names. Borf. Where are you? Okay. Crane uh Crane. No crane? No crane. Uh Crenshaw. No Crenshaw. Devore. Yeah. Evans. No Evans. Fisher. Yeah. Paul. Yeah. Keller's here. Lou is here. Moore. Yeah. Nix is here. Yeah. Pace. He came by before class. Page. Yeah. Uh, Payella. Uh, here. That's not right. Pahela. Pahela. Yeah. Pahela. Jesus. That's yes. it. Jesus. Pahela. Yeah. I keep wanting to make the uh, okay. Shut up, you. Uh, Pruitt, Saab is here. Saab is here. Sloger, I thought I saw you. Sloger, no Sloger. Uh, Stone, Walton, Walton, as in mountain, and Woods. All right, y'all get out of here. No homework. Come in Wednesday, ready to work on some more completing the square. Thank you for the pizza. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, thank you for the pizza. Yep.